Today we have just two speakers, Tamamas True, Maso True from the University of California, Los Angeles, and Lee Armas from the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center at Caltech. Our third speaker, Jacob Bean from the University of Chicago, had to cancel today, and we are working to reschedule someone from the Transiting Exoplanet team for a future webinar. So first up is Tomaso True, so please take it away. Thank you, Margaret. So it's a true pleasure to be here, although I wish the times were a little easier. The last few days have been rough for everyone, so uh, first I would like to wish everyone the best in these difficult times. And and you know, let's try to do some science in the meantime. So I'm going to give an overview of our program. It's entitled Through the Looking Glass, a JWST Exploration of Galaxy Formation and Evolution from Cosmic Dawn to Present Day. Uh, this project is led by me in collaboration with the GLASS JWST ERS team. And the main point of that program, of this program, is that we're going to use a cluster of galaxies as a cosmic telescope to probe the universe fainter and to higher resolution than ever before. And so we're going to try to give everyone a view, the deepest view of the universe that we can in early release science data. And one of the main goals from a technical standpoint of this program is to exercise the multispectroscopy modes of JWST. One of the things that will be revolutionary of JWST is that it will be a fully spectroscopic telescope with a lot of spectrographs on board. And I think this is something new because the capabilities are well beyond what Hubble had. And so we want to try to make some measurements that will help the community understand the potential of each spectrograph in this kind of studies. So the team is middle size, I would say, medium. There's a, here's the full list of people. And you can read more on our project and the team at our website. You see the URL at the bottom of this page. So our primary target is the Hubble Frontier Field Abel 2744. This is a massive cluster of galaxies that has been imaged to very deep magnitudes by the Hubble Space Telescope in an effort to probe uh, the early universe using the effect, the magnification effect by the foreground cluster of galaxies that makes galaxies behind it appear bigger and brighter than without the assistance of a telescope. And you can see everything that you see in this image is pretty much foreground. All those yellow balls of stars are massive galaxies in the cluster. But then you see little blue arclets. Those are the tens or hundreds of multiple image sources that are behind the cluster that we use to reconstruct the mass distribution of the cluster and therefore reconstruct the magnification, if you will, reconstruct the optics of this natural telescope that we use to study the universe behind it. We're going to observe this cluster in a variety of modes. In our primary field, which is the center of the cluster, we're going to do spectroscopy with NIRIS, um, wide field suitless spectroscopy. And we're going to use three grisms uh, covering for about one micron to two micron for a depth of 35 kiloseconds. And then we're going to use NERSPEC, the multi-object spectrograph mode, at a higher resolution of 2700 covering a slightly longer wavelength range for 52 kiloseconds of exposure. And the, the, the main goal here is to study faint galaxies behind the cluster. In parallel, while we're using the spectrographs in the core of the cluster, we will be using NERCAM to take imaging in seven bands. And this will be the deepest images taken at part, as part of the ERS. And so it will be uh, far away from the cluster center to be effectively a deep field similar to the Hubble deep fields or others that you've been familiar with in the past two decades. There's also additional data that will be taken on this cluster as part of the GTO programs. And so this, I hope, will be a very useful set of data for everyone to play with as soon as JWST commissioning is over. So the layout is shown here. And I'm showing this figure here that illustrates the center of the cluster. You can see in black, this black circle, NERS and NERSPEC. This is where we're going to take our spectra. 
And the parallel fields are going to end up in these gray regions. We don't know exactly where because it depends on the orientation of the telescope when the data are taken. There's probably not going to be overlap with the parallel of the existing Hubble field, Frontier field data. And so we are working to provide the community with additional uh, optical data. We've taken very deep Magellan imaging of the wide field, and we will try to gather more optical data to supplement. But of course, seven bands with JWST are probably more powerful than anything that has ever been done before. So even if there's no overlap with the current type of interior field, parallel field, or other optical data, the data will be self-contained and extremely powerful. So the two key science drivers we had in our proposal are what, are the, what sources ionize the universe and when. So we're trying to find out what were the sources responsible for cosmic ionization. And we know they're fainter than what has been probed so far by Hubble, because if we count everything identified by Hubble so far, we know they don't produce enough photons to ionize the universe. So there has to be some other population that we, we think, we hope we can uncover. And the second point is, a question is, how do baryons cycle through galaxies? This is a long-standing question. We don't know how baryons get in inside galaxies, transform into stars. Stars then produce metals and heavy elements, and those get ejected then into the intergalactic medium. And we hope to shed some light on that question too. So these are the two science questions. And the important point is our observations will be the deepest ERS, ERS observations, trying to address these two questions. So. So the first big question is the epoch of ionization, and related to that is understanding Lyman alpha. In fact, most of what we know about the epoch of ionization comes from Lyman alpha, because that's the, one of the few lines that is accessible from present technology at ratio greater than seven. And based on Lyman alpha and other probes, we know now that the universe goes from being completely neutral almost to almost completely ionized between ratio eight and six. But we know, don't know exactly what population does it. And you can see the curves on this plot uh, are curves that show the ionization fraction of the universe for different hypotheses on, on the ionizing population. And you can see that in order to match the data, you need to have very, either very faint galaxies, as faint as minus 12, and we have never seen those because those are beyond our detection limit, or you need to have relatively uncomfortable high escape fraction of 20%, which is, means that one in five ionizing photons escapes the galaxy into the intergalactic medium. And the interpretation of this is difficult because we need not only to understand how the Lyman alpha interacts with the intergalactic medium, but also how it's affected by the interstellar medium and the stuff around the galaxy, which we call the circumgalactic medium. And for example, we think that galaxies may not be completely uniform. There may be holes in the gas that allow Lyman alpha to leak out and escape. And so the practical question we're trying to answer is, what's the line profile of Lyman alpha? How does it get uh, redshifted, for example, and therefore affect its ability to escape the local environment? What's the spatial distribution of Lyman alpha with respect to the UV continuum that we use to identify and select these objects? And then the lingering question is, maybe these galaxies are different, because we, we have seen a glimpse of the fact that some galaxies redshift eight, have much stronger emission lines than their counterparts are at year seven or six. And so maybe what we're witnessing is a change in the galaxy population. And we need different pieces of information to disentangle all these possible hypotheses. And so JWST has two spectra that are very useful for us. One is NERSPEC and one is NEARES. NERSPEC provides us with the high spectral resolution. Uh, and so we can probe the kinematics of the line. And nearest gives us the spatial information. We can see where the line is coming from. And in practice, the two quantities we can characterize as slit losses. So if you have a certain slit with NERSPEC, and this is shown on the left-hand side panel, um, as a function of offset from the continuum in a fraction of an arc second, you can see that you can lose quite a bit of flux if your Lyman alpha is extended. And the typical redshift two Lyman alpha offsets, offset scales to redshift seven are the gray band and so you see that if you put your nearest near spec slit on the center of the UV continuum, you may be missing 70% of your flux just because that's not where Lyman alpha comes out from. And in, on the right-hand side, instead I show 
the line profile, and these are different hypotheses for how much redshift there is in the line. And this may come, for example, from winds or outflows or things that make it easier for the line to escape the galaxy by being redshifted out of resonance with the neutral hydrogen. And with the resolution of NERSC spec, we can actually measure the line profile and the kinematics, which helps us understanding what's going on. So, uh, and, and this is to give you an idea, instead of the nearest capabilities, this is a simulation of nearest. This is a galaxy uh, that is pretty faint by present day standards as an equivalent width that is pretty normal. And you can see there's also the nearest would be able not only to detect Lyman alpha in this case, but also carbon three and carbon four, which are useful diagnostics because uh, they are less strongly absorbed by the intergalactic medium. And, and so nearest will give us not only the detection, but also their spatial distribution. And we can measure the offset with respect to the UV continuum. And of course, imaging will also be helpful for the epoch periodization. We will have two deep parallel fields, one reaching 29.4 and 129 AB in seven bands. Okay, and so this will be the deepest ERS field. And you'll see how the filters are so very well positioned to probe the Lyman Bray galaxy population from Redshift 7 and above. Uh, we will be able to identify all these galaxies as, as dropouts, but in general, with this filter complement, we will be able to do photoses uh, with very high accuracies of all the galaxies in the field. And so this will allow us in turn to construct the luminosity function and the stellar mass function of these galaxies out to these uh, early times and, and, and connect with the spectroscopic inferences to see what is, what is the population responsible for cosmic ionization. This is a forecast of how many objects we'll see. This is just for one uh, NERCAM field, so you have to multiply this by four effectively. The vertical line that I'm pointing at with my cursor, the, the thicker one is our depth of 29.4. And you can see we're going pretty deep and we're going to see hundreds of galaxies, say for example, redshift four to six, and thousands of galaxies at all redshift. We forecast about 200 galaxies redshift seven, 80 redshift eight, 30 redshift nine, and nine at redshift 10. There's also good synergy with the Sears program that I would like to highlight. We are deeper and we have the 0909 filter that Sears doesn't have, but Sears of course is wider, they have a wider area. So I think the synergy will be, between the two will be very powerful. We can provide, we can target the fainter galaxies, which are the ones to see to, that we're interested in, but they will provide the larger numbers to, to be able to characterize the brighter and more rare part of the population. And so this is something to look forward to. And uh, the second question is how do baryons cycle through galaxies? And the way we measure this, this is an example from a paper by Xin Wang recently published where there's a galaxy, this galaxy is lensed and with the Grism on Hubble, we were able to measure a bunch of emission lines uh, that you can see here labeled in this plot. And from these emission lines, you can infer the gas metallicity. And in this case, we discover an interesting phenomenon where we see that uh, the metallicity is the opposite of what generally is the case for normal galaxies, where you have more metal-rich gas in the outskirts of the galaxies rather than the in, in the parts of the galaxy. And we explain this by having a gigantic mass outflow rate that basically we have cold pristine gas coming. We have pristine gas coming in which is fueling a huge starburst. And this starburst is blowing out a humongous amount of mass, carrying a lot of metals with it, giving rise to this sort of um, behavior. And that's kind of like the kind of things we're looking for. We want to do this kind of measurements with higher resolution at, at redshift and higher redshift. And this we will be able to do this with our program for some cases, of course. And the power here is that we will be able to combine the two spectra of nearest and near spec. Near spec will give us, again, the high spectral resolution, but the slits of near spec are pretty small. In this diagram, you see two uh, single slits of near spec overlaid onto a galaxy. And you see that if you don't know where you're landing with the red and the blue 
slate, you may end up with completely different inferences about the metallicity of the galaxy. See, the red and blue have very different absorption as characterized by AV, very different star formation rates, and very different metallicities. And if you were able instead to look at the entire galaxy, which is the green contours, you will get some somewhat different answer. And so by targeting the same object with nearest and nearest spec, we will be able not only to see what the global properties of the galaxies are, but also understand how we interpret the information that we get from a single slit with nearest spec. And we will have, of course, many other targets in our nearest spec MSA, and we will fill them out with high redshift galaxies. And this is some of the criteria that we use to prioritize the population of galaxies that we put in our slit, um, starting with spectroscopically confirmed high gal redshift galaxies, and then down to lower redshifts for a variety of uses. So we think this would be a large enough sample that would be cases of interest for many people. And the science enabling product of our team will be, we, we work in two stages. Our goal is stage one within one year of launch, more or less, and we hope to release a working version of an object-based multi-instrument exploration tool. Um, the strength of our program is that we can look at the same objects with multiple instruments. So we want to be able for people to see how does the spectrum taken with NERS compare with the spectrum taken with NERS take of the same object. Uh, a forced extraction tool for NERIS that allows us to, this, to allow the user to decide I want to extract a spectrum at this position. What does it look like? Spectroscopic templates of redshift greater than five sources. We don't know what their optical rest frame properties of these galaxies look like. And by combining a few, we can provide the equivalent of the line and break templates at higher redshift and in the rest frame optical. Uh, spectral quantities and catalogs like lines and fluxes and so on and so forth, and imaging catalogs of the near, near, near come parallels for a chip greater than seven, seven galaxies. Uh, this is, of course, a complicated data set. We will have multiple instruments and we will have pretty sophisticated data set with lots of spectroscopy. So we plan to spend another year after stage one to do a quantitative comparison of nearest and nearest spectra and update and improve all the stage one products, which of course will be uh, just preliminary at stage one. Uh, current activities. So we are preparing as well as we can for the launch. We've published a couple of papers, one that shows an estimate of the Lyman alpha UV continuum offsets in this redshift range 3 to 5.5, which is kind of like the baseline we want to compare to for the higher redshift observations with JWST. And we also publicly released a versatile tool for cluster lensing source reconstruction. It's called Lenstruction. And you can see here that you observe a galaxy and you can model and reconstruct what the intrinsic properties of the source will be given a lens model. And there are all the public lens models of the Hubble Frontier fields here. So people will be able to play with that and get their own reconstruction of sources they're interested in. I think this will be useful to the community. We're also updating the NERSPEC target list to match the launch data. So of course, time has elapsed since we submitted our proposal and we have obtained new data on the, on the field and we want to have the best possible selection of targets for NERSPEC. So we're working on that. We're also working on a simulator completeness calculator for NERCAM and NERIS, which will include the effects of lensing so for a given population and a given mass model, what we expect to see, what we do we expect to recover, how deep we expect to go. And finally, um, we are doing some follow-up of high-Z candidates with ground-based spectroscopy in preparation for JWST so that we will have ground-based data to compare to for the sources that are, of course, uh, bright enough to do that. And so this is what we're currently working on. Uh, what's next? Um, we're still in the process of develop realistic simulations with finalized JWST keywords from SDSCI. So we are working and being in contact with the, J with the SDSCI team to make sure that we can use these simulations for all three of our instruments. We would like to help the Institute by test pipelines well before launch date. We expect, uh, we plan on having some members of our team visit SDSCI to interact with specialists 
uh, we would like to run simulated data through the pipelines and make public the data product. This is one of our goals. <clears throat> and we're also working on forecasts for relevant ERS observations. And, and of course, at some point, we will develop a, a graphic user interface to navigate the data. And this will be kind of probably the last step we undertake once all the other ones are done. And then hopefully, the longer awaited launch, March 2021, that we are looking forward so much. And uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Tommaso. That was very informative. I'd like to open this up for questions from people online. Um, what I'd like you to do is just unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, Margaret, I have a question if I'm allowed. Oh, yes, you're allowed. <laughs> Tommaso, that was really good. Thanks. Um, I tend to think of the slitless spectroscopy as having a lot of power, but a lot, also a lot of complication. Are you forcing, are you forcing multiple roles? Because I'm really interested in the sort of offset between the lines and the continuum. Are you, are you forcing that, or, or how are you dealing with, with disentangling the spatial spectral? So nearest gives you two perpendicular spectra. Oh, okay, Autom right. automatically. automatically. So okay. we're going to get two perpendicular um, dispersions. And that's, that's a strategy that we've used in glass with HST, mm -hmm. and it works pretty well even in crowded fields. Of course, there will be some sources that will be contaminated mm -hmm. in both position angles and those, for those there's not much you can do. But for the majority of the sources, you can learn a lot by having two perpendicular dispersions. So I think that's one of the strong suits of NIRIS and we're glad that this comes for free in NIRIS because uh, it was quite a lot of work to do it with HST, but this would be very important for all the NIRIS data types. Interesting. Can you pull up your, I think it was your slide 16 again, which was the one where you show the paper with the offset. Oh yeah, this one. This one, impact of alignment of a spatial offset and where she trends. Yeah, so is the, are we seeing, it looks like, I mean, it's hard to read, but it looks like the, you're, you're suggesting a smaller offset. Yes, yes. So the, one of the findings of this paper was that the offsets were smaller than previously claimed, which I think um, is in some sense good news. Uh, but we don't know what, what will happen in higher redshifts, right? Because at this point, we are still well below cosmic ionization, and we are still in a regime where there's much less gas. Once Lyman Alpha starts, starts bouncing around more, we have to see what will happen. Certainly, the, measure, the offices we measure were lower than what previously was published, although the uncertainty on the previous measurement was fairly high. So. It's yeah, they're still, they're still non-zero and they're going to change. And so it's really, I think this is a really interesting aspect yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. And we wanted to have a good baseline. So we had a very large data set of Lyman Alpha and UV continuum measurements. And we developed a pretty fancy tool to make this measurement. And, and, the, and you can see the error bars are much smaller than the previous measurement. So. Okay, does anyone else on the call have another question for Tommaso? Well, is there anyone else on the call? <laughs> Maybe just oh, the no, four no. of us. No, 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 no. We actually have, you know, okay. I think almost I'm, 20 I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, I, so, just a technical question is um, because these fields have been studied before with HST, that enables you to get the positional accuracy for near spec, is that correct? That's right. Yeah, and we use the Apple Frontier field imaging to design the near spec observations. Right, and approximately how many sources are you expecting to get in one near spec MSA? About 50, you know, 40 to 50. Okay. Based on our simulations. So it would be kind of like a, a very eclectic bunch of sources, but I think it would be great for exploration because there would be something for everyone. Mm -hmm. I had one more quick question, Margaret. Sorry. Please. Yeah, uh, no, please. Tommaso, I can't remember, were there any of the 
I, were there any of these sort of sources detected with IRAC? Because you have the two IRAC filters, you know, the pseudo IRAC filters, the, for the bright ones. Yeah, you mean the IRAC excess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we have, so if you, I, I went back to the slides here. Um, we have uh, the second high priority sources for us are sources that are selected with Spitzer to have extremely high equivalent width of H alpha and O3. These are the IRAC excess galaxies. And there's five of them. Ah, that's really good. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize that. Well, I went very fast through this slide. So. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. 